I want to welcome you to worship on this Sunday morning, and I'm sure that you're all recovering from your time at Moondance Jam, right? And um, the, the traffic was a little bit thicker with lots of RVs this morning, but um, yeah, I kind of forgot that that was happening. Uh, I just Was it the quiet on Mule Lake? Um, a number of announcements or things I'd like to say this morning. Uh, you'll notice in the bulletin there's a recipe for soup. And I was almost tempted to make that up, but soup on a day like this does a, is not terribly appealing. But this is a soup recipe that will feed 50 people. And so um, when we put our heads together, maybe we'll have this uh, lentil sausage soup. So you can say, put that in your recipe box. The, uh, and the theme today, of course, is food for all. It's, uh, the, the text is when Jesus feeds the well over 5,000 people. And so um, this service it focuses on that, focuses on scarce, uh, abundance rather than scarcity. And last week I proudly announced, uh, I was a little bit confused last week, I thought our annual meeting was the day, but it was last week. I told you all that today would be the fifth Sunday. So you've all come with your fifth Sunday offering. Well, it's not the fifth Sunday. Um, um, that's August, August 29th. So be prepared for August 29th. Um, I certainly want to lift up prayers for the people throughout the world, really, that are dealing with climate. Uh, I, I don't think I have a right to complain but my lawn is drier than it's ever been. And um, I was so hoping Thursday night I'd get rain, and I just got two tenths of an inch. So I can't control that, uh, but um, I, our prayers are for the people that really are struggling, the farmers. Um, the people in Ely, uh, they had to cancel their blueberry festival because of 70 mile hour winds that came through Thursday night and just destroyed all the vendors. So our prayers are for people that are dealing with things that are beyond their control. Tonight, 7 o'clock, we have our gazebo concert. Ryan Pels will somehow enter. Uh, I don't know. I was not around the first time that Ryan Pels entered the gazebo concert, but he was at the top of a tree <laughs> when the concert started. So with Ryan, we never know quite what we're going to get, but we know it's going to be enjoyable. I want to welcome Rick James uh, to sing this Sunday, and we're looking forward to that. And um, we will have coffee and snacks after worship. It'll be done upstairs uh, because our lower level is fill filling up with rummage items or uh, good works or good sale items. And Sue, you have something to say about that. have to have on my sax hat for Sax Fifth Avenue. I want a, Sonia to stand up. She's a perfect example of what you're going to find in the Sax Fifth Avenue store downstairs. Oh, thank you. Look at the jewelry, <laughs> bracelets, <Ta> shoes, <laughs> and even hats. She has a black feather hat that's stunning. I do want to thank everyone that's going to have their coffee up here for the next three weeks, and that's because scarcity and abundance, we have an abundance downstairs. We have things from paddle boat to piano. And because the downstairs is being overrun, we are going to start sorting early, like Monday, like tomorrow. So I have another sign-up sheet for this week, I will be here every day starting at 10 a.m. and you can come and open bags, open boxes at your leisure. So 10 a.m., we need all sorts of help. And I wanna thank the crew. It was, I think it was Thursday night. We had our table crew. We had Linda here opening boxes. We had Ruby setting up Christmas already, if you can believe that. But all the tables are up and we, uh, have some special spots for special treasures. And this is one. Arden Johnson. This is a fence post. 
he carved, and it is also a candle holder, full of acorns right now. But Mike, Michael and Sheila are donating this for the sale, and I also saw the beautiful painting back there that I'll show you next week. These will be special items, specialty items for this sale. So again, thank you for all your giving and all your time that you're going to give because it's going to be a wonderful sale for a wonderful cause. Good day. So we could listen to you all day. <laughs> you have a sermon under the belt? We gather on this day saying no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome and that this is the day that God has created. Let us rejoice and be thankful in it and we will pray, pray for Ken and Esther back there. Ken is operating the cameras today and uh, so the service is not being live streamed. It will be up later this afternoon on our website. Let us begin our worship service with our call to worship. We join together as hungry eaters to be nourished by the food that you offer us. God of sustenance, give us this day our daily bread. As you care for the wheat fields that turn into bread and the vineyards that labor to produce sweet wine, tend to our bodies by feeding us what we need for healthy growth. God of abundance, give us this day our daily bread. The rich crops that you have prepared are now ready to be harvested by our hands and our hearts. Holy Spirit, come, give us this day our daily bread. And a part of the bread and the nourishment that we gather in this place is truly the Spirit of God which descends upon and within us, and we invite that spirit as we listen to music being played. The Prayer of Invocation. Holy Chef, may we savor the dishes that you have prepared for us this day. With each bite of your holy feast, enliven our senses so that we may delight in the new and tantalizing flavors you have created. The Prayer of Confession. Great Provider, we recognize that widespread hunger is no longer necessary. You have given us humans the resources to feed all people, yet we are selfish. 
while we overfill our bellies with food and lay to waste the spaces needed for crops to flourish, others are crying out for crumbs from our tables. Living God, cultivate within our hearts reckless generosity and plant within us spirits of simplicity and balance in body and soul. Hear these words of assurance, though at times we fail to be generous. Your generosity toward us, God, is never ending. By sending Christ and the Spirit to your people, you have extended generosity beyond measure. Thanks be to God. Amen. The scripture reading is John 6, verses 1 through 21. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this story, but it is definitely worth listening to it again. Sometime later, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, is Lake Tiberias, and a huge crowd followed him, impressed by the signs he gave by healing sick people. Jesus climbed the hillside and sat down there with the disciples. It was shortly before the Jewish feast of Passover. Looking up, Jesus saw the crowd approaching and said to Philip, where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? Jesus knew very well what he was going to do, but asked this to test Philip's response. Philip answered, not even with 200 days' wages could we buy loaves enough to give each of them a mouthful. One of the disciples, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, said, There's a small boy here with five barley loaves and two dried fish, but what good is that for so many people? Jesus said to them, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, and as many as 5,000 people sat down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave them out to all who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, giving out as much as they could eat. Well, when the people had eaten their fill, Jesus said to the disciples, Gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing gets wasted. So they picked them up, filled 12 baskets with the scrap left over from the five barley loaves. The people, seeing this sign that Jesus had performed, said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Seeing that they were about to come and carry him off to crown him as ruler, Jesus escaped into the hills alone. As evening approached, the disciples went down to the lake. They got into their boat, intending to cross to Capernaum, which was on the other side of the lake. By this time, it was dark, and Jesus had still not joined them. Moreover, a stiff wind was blowing, and the sea was becoming rough. When they had rowed three or four miles, they caught sight of Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. They were frightened, but he told them, It's me. Don't be afraid. They were able to take him into the boat, but suddenly the boat was ashore at their destination. Thank you, Sonia. I uh, uh, preach mostly or partly from my iPad, and as Sonia was reading that wonderful text and doing it in such a way that I think we could really hear it anew, um, my internet messages or email the headline comes in, and as she was reading the, the passage about people being filled, there was an advertisement for big stomachs. 
You know, I, I, I want to um, do a couple things here. One is that um, we, for the last six, seven weeks, we've been in Samuel. We've been reading the story of the call of David as a shepherd. We have been reading about his life and his early victories and how righteous a man he was. Uh, we have read about the people wanting him as king and him being anointed and being blessed. And I find it curious that my resources that I use from the United Church of Christ, um, uh, it's called Sermon Seeds, and so the author focuses on one text, and I usually go with her choice. And I found it curious that this week we left the journey of David. And let me read in part the story that is in the lectionary for this day. In the spring that time of year when rulers go off to war, David sent Joab along with his, with his officers and troops. They massacred the Ammonites and laid siege to Rabbah. David, however, stayed in Jerusalem. As evening approached, David rose from his couch and strolled onto the flat roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman, a very beautiful woman, bathing, and David made inquiries about her and learned that her name was Bathsheba, which means daughter of an oath, and that she was the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent a message, messengers to fetch her. She came to him, and he slept with her at a time when she had been declared ritually clean after her monthly period. Then she returned to her house, but she conceived and then sent this message to David, I am pregnant. And the story goes on that David entices Uriah to come back from the battlefield, and he, it is his hope that as Uriah comes back that he will spend his time with Bathsheba, but he is so ashamed from being not with his troops that he sleeps with the troops that are local. He does not go home. He does not have the pleasure of being with wife and with all of the trimmings of good food and company. And that goes on for several nights, and David is concerned that he will not sleep with Bathsheba. And so he sends the message to the generals to have Uriah put at the front of the battle, and the text ends with it saying, so Uriah stayed in Jerusalem another day. On the following day, David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him and got him drunk. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. The letter said, put Uriah opposite the enemy, where the fighting is the fiercest, and then back off, leaving Uriah exposed that he, so that he will meet death. So Joab, during the siege of the city, stationed Uriah where he knew the strongest soldiers would be attacking. When the soldiers of the city rallied and fought against Joab, some of David's troops fell, and so did Uriah the Hittite. We have two stories that we've listened to today, the incredible story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it really was not 5,000, it was 5,000 men, which means that it could have been as high as 10,000 people were on this hill. And they didn't come to the hill to eat, they came to see and experience Jesus, who had become a leader who had become one who was about healing and one who was about teaching. And then we have David. And David has had it pretty good. He's been victorious. He's been blessed by God. And then he sees Bathsheba, and he asks his servants, his messengers, to bring Bathsheba to him. The story's not long. He sleeps with her, she becomes pregnant. When I grew up, we heard that story, and there was a part of preachers who said, and this was a long time ago, boys will be boys. 
and the behavior was glossed over and it was excused. And yet, as we read this text on this day, as we are aware of politicians and those in power, this text also speaks to them. Power does corrupt, and David is corrupted, and if this were to occur today, we would call it rape and murder. Now David's blessing by God is not withdrawn. God is displeased. The child that is conceived dies. The rest of David's reign is really tarnished with the the rape of his daughter Tamar. And then one of his children kills the rapist. And then there's Absalom, his son, who tries to overthrow his father. And then Solomon, who is birthed by Bathsheba, then becomes the king that follows David. He has, the rest of his days are tarnished and rocky because of his behavior. But God does not abandon him. So we have a style of leadership where David is about his needs and Jesus is about the needs of the people. In this story of Jesus, we have two remarkable things that really violate or cross over natural law. I mean, I don't know how out of very little you create enough food for everyone to eat and have their fill, maybe 10,000 people. And I note that when they gathered up the baskets that were left over, there were 12, and the, um, but there was bread, not any fish. So I, I looked up what, what was a popular fish on, on uh, Galilee and Lake Tiberias, and uh, the fish that was, is popular is not walleye. I, I don't think they grow in the Middle East, but it's tilapia. So I imagine people had quite a feast. And it was enough. It was more than enough. And I think about that phrase, enough is enough. That phrase emerged in the, I believe it was the 1500s, and at that stage enough enough meant enough is good enough, we don't need any more. Another way of saying enough is as good as a feast. And then as we move into our time and our memory, enough is enough is the phrase that came out of the civil rights, out of the feminist movement, Enough is enough. We need to cease poor behavior. So Jesus comes before this crowd, and he's testing his disciples. He knows that they don't have the resources to feed these people. He knows there's not enough money, even in that crowd, to pay for such a feast. But he's testing them. And he is discerning the need of the people before they know their need. He is perceiving that they will be hungry and they need to be fed. I think about Ho Chi Minh early on in Vietnam. His strategy was to feed the people and to give them shoes. They didn't want to be communists, but they wanted to be fed. They wanted to have shoes. Well, Jesus was that kind of leader where he determined the needs of the people. Now, I've read this story probably a hundred, maybe, well, I don't think a thousand, but I've read this story many times. And as I was reading the story this time, something caught my attention that I had not paid attention to. And I think it's uh, really good that we have Elliot with us. And Elliot's in the back seat over there. And Elliot, did you say you're 10 years old? And I'm thinking of Elliot. There's a phrase in this text 
that we gloss over, one of the disciples, Simon Peter's brother Andrew, said, There's a small boy here with five loaves of barley and two dried fish. But what good is that for so many people? So I imagine Elliot out on that hill. And Elliot's kind of curious. And uh, I think he's kind of wandering around. He's probably wandered away from his grandparents and his parents. And as kids can be, you know, it's amazing what they hear. I imagine he's standing kind of at a distance as Jesus is having this conversation about feeding the people. And it's just before Passover. They know that they're going to have a great feast and uh, they're going to do a remembering of their liberation. But Elliot looks down at his five loaves of barley and his fish, and he thinks to himself, you know what? Maybe I can help out. Maybe I can offer this bread and this fish to the food that's going to be needed. We often hear that the children will lead us. Well, it was that small boy. That small boy that was not afraid to approach those adults. That small boy that was not afraid to approach um, Andrew. That small boy that opened up his arms and said, here, take what I have and use it. This small boy, and I hope Elliot, is not afraid of scarcity. I've got food, of course I'll share. I've got these fish, of course. I'll share with my friends and my neighbors and the strangers. And it was this small boy that came up with a theology of abundance. Of course, there is going to be enough. And that miracle, that miracle, I mean, there are folks that don't want to diminish the power of Jesus to feed the people. But what would be more miraculous, Jesus coming up with all of this bread and fish, or would the more miraculous act be because of a small boy being willing to give of what he had, there was a change of heart in the people that were gathered. They saw this one simple act and they said, if that small boy can do that, we can open up our bags and our backpacks and our satchels and we can pull out the food that we have brought. And there will be enough. Rather than us hoarding on to what we have, rather than saying, you know, if, if there's a drought or if something happens, I want to make sure that I have enough food for myself, rather than having hearts that say, I'm going to hold on to what I have. The act of this boy the act of Jesus giving a prayer of thanks and then distributing the bread and the fish, but the act of those five, those 10,000 people was the real miracle. We do live, I think, in a world where too often we guard and protect. And even in the church, there are times that People come up with a big dream and we're sitting back there and saying, gee, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have enough time. I don't, I don't know if we have enough people. I mean, can we really do a gazebo concert and, and people will help out? Or can we do that Christmas concert and the musicians will, can we really do that? Well, if we come at the issues that face us, with this sense, well, uh, I'm going to guard myself, rather than a theology of abundance. The world's going to be a much poorer place. 
So as we hear this text, and as we hear about the two kinds of leadership, a kind of leadership that is intuitive, that, that imagine the, imagines the needs of the people out there before they're even asked, over and against a leadership that wants just for me, or a leadership that is about power and control, which person are we going to follow? So it is we follow in the ways of Christ. So it is that we leave this place knowing that we live in a place of abundance. And so it is you can still bring your things to the sale. You can, you can begin to have a spirit of knowing that all is possible and that God might be doing a new thing on this day. And I cannot explain as well as I think I understand the gift of this young boy why it is that I know that Jesus left the crowds. When, when you're with crowds, even with, with all of you, there's a certain amount of energy we exchange with each other. And oftentimes on a Sunday afternoon, the only thing I want to do is go home and take a nap. Well, Jesus needed a nap. He went up into the mountains. He prayed. He reflected on the experience. What did I do that was good? What did I do that was wrong? He gave thanks to God for that small boy that came forth. And so he was gone, and the disciples needed to get back, and they got in their boat, and then it's stormy, and it's dark, and they see Jesus walking on water towards the boat. Now, that's one I can't explain. I know people have said, this is terrible. He knew where the rocks were. <laughs> he could walk from here to here. But Jesus was a person that was connected to that divine, that holy, that mysterious energy that we call God, Father, Mother, Spirit, Wisdom. Today, would you speak with that God or that power, however you name it, and ask God for a heart of abundance. We can give so much. We can love even more. We can do even more. God has called us to be those followers of a way of life that gives and gives in a life that becomes abundant. Thanks be to God. Amen. There is much to pray for on this day, and as we pray, we are tapping into God's Spirit. And in our prayers, we also need to take time to listen to God. But let us be in a spirit of prayer. God who is mysterious, God who is ever-present, God who names and claims each one of us, would you hear our prayers today? Would you hear those prayers that emerge, emerge from our hearts, prayers for ones that we love and care for who are ill or who have died? We pray for those who sorrow on this day. May they be comforted by your presence and your healing nature. May they also be comforted by our connection with them. We pray for families who are in conflict, those who have been vaccinated and those who have not. God, may you give us a spirit of courage 
and forgiveness, a spirit of listening and loving. Bless our families. Help us to speak with one another out of care and love and listen. We pray for those who are hungry and fearful of sources that seem to be scarce. May we find ways within our families and ways within our country and world that we can open up our hearts and our storerooms and find ways to feed and shelter the world. We can do this. And God of wisdom and of humor, look upon us as your creatures. We are flawed and we fail too many times. Forgive us when we care only for self. Forgive us when we falter and when we fail. Forgive us for those times when we do not listen to your wisdom or follow in your ways. And bless our recovery. Bless our vision. Open our eyes and our ears. And God bless this faith community, this church. May we be your disciples in the midst of Walker and this area. We pray all of this in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Your offering may be left in the plate as you entered the church. Hear this invitation to offering. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. As we have been granted great abundance, let us offer up those blessings in God's name. Amen. And we welcome Rick.
could be too great a cause for sharing life with one who's lost. Through his love our hearts can feel all the So I think with Rick, we could combine you with Sue, with her hat, and you with your tie, and we could have a great time together. Uh, before I, I offer the blessing over, well, let me do that. Let, the blessing over the gifts is this, God of wonders, who enabled Jesus and Elisha to feed the multitudes, bless these gifts and use them to fill empty stomachs and empty hearts. May our offerings be multiplied to abundantly nourish all the people. I, I want to apologize to Emmy. I left her out of the story. I think you would have been with Elliot when the, you had the bread and the fish. So you both would have been there. And I want to thank all of you for being here and present and our need for one another and the Lord. Hear this benediction. God's love is overwhelming. As we have been fed this day, let us go and offer food and drink to others. Grant us holy instincts of faith as we trust in you, O God, to place the final touches on our culinary masterpieces. And may we become a tossed salad, feeding the people. Amen. <laughs>